Okay, so thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. My name is Kayla Rogers, and I'm a program supervisor for the Women's Fund for Health Education and Resiliency. We have been partnering with UHD for a few years now, offering this health lecture series to students, faculty, and staff, um, and also open to the public. And we're really excited to be wrapping up another semester. We have a very exciting presentation today, um, but before we get into that, for those of you who have never heard of the Women's Fund, we are a nonprofit here in Houston. We provide free health education for women and girls through focused seminars like today's session, as well as curriculum-based classes and publications. Um, we want to provide women and girls with the tools they need to be advocates for their health. So all of our um, programs and publications are free of charge. If you're interested in learning more about the Women's Fund or um, getting any of our publications for yourself, I encourage you to visit our website, thewomensfund.org, where you can find um, PDF versions of our publications. So today we are fortunate enough to have Jillian Nell here speaking to us about financial wellness. Um, Jillian is actually the board president for the Women's Fund, so I'm really excited to have her here today helping us out and giving this presentation. Before I turn the floor over, just a little information about Jillian. She is the Director of Financial Planning for Inscription Capital. She is a certified financial planner professional and a certified divorce financial analysis. Jillian and her team provide comprehensive financial planning, divorce planning, and risk management to individual clients, business owners, and their families. She also provides consulting and advisory services for qualified retirement plans to business owners, plan administrators, and participants. Within her divorce practice, Jillian also serves as a financial neutral for collaborative divorce proceedings. She has a passion for education and the empowerment it provides to both clients and the general public. She regularly speaks at financial planning seminars and employee educational meetings on how goal setting and risk management is essential for success in any financial planning scenario. Jillian's charitable efforts include membership in the Corporate Guild for Dress for Success Houston. And she's the president, as I mentioned, of the board of directors for the Women's Fund and is a board member for the HER Foundation that supports the Women's Fund, both local Houston charities that support women and girls in the community. So Jillian, we are so thrilled to have you here today, and I'm gonna go ahead and turn the floor over to you at this time. Okay, thank you so much. I'm thrilled to see how many people have come. Um, it's awesome. Uh, and you guys all seem very excited to hear what I have to say, which sometimes is not normal, because. <laughs> We may have to get some stuff done after this presentation, and that is my goal, is to give you actionable items, really, that you will implement, hopefully today or this week, even if it's one or two things. Um, and I also hope that it there is an action item for every type of person that's on this call, whether you're a student or faculty or part of the public. I'm also thrilled that I see some men in the audience, too. It takes a what a financially well and an emotionally well man too to help support women and girls so thrilled to see men within um, this session also uh, and if anybody needs to stop me and ask me a question please do so having a little bit of dialogue sometimes is helpful for um, you know putting some of the stuff that we're talking about into real life so please feel free to do that Okay, I'm just going to share my screen. Give me just one second. Of course, when I'm under the gun to share it, I can't figure out how to make it look good. And it's doing that weird thing where it catches what I'm saying. Isn't that awesome? I don't want to use the subtitles. I 
if you want, we can pull it up on our end and then you can just let us know when you want to advance. Okay, um, let me see. Okay, can you guys see a page with some pretty colors on it? And it says financial wellness? Yes. Okay, great. Okay, so you've already learned about me. If you wanna connect with me on LinkedIn, please do so. I'd love to have as many friends as possible. Um, financial planning is what I do on a daily basis. I also advise uh, qualified retirement plans, so 401k plans. Um, and happy for anybody who's in this call if they have any questions to reach out either on email or link in with me if you'd like to. Okay, everybody can see this next slide where it talks about wellness is and then the financial green pie is sticking out. Yes. Okay, great. Okay, so the Women's Fund has been doing this for 40 years, uh, equipping women and girls with the tools necessary for resiliency. And part of that is all of these portions of the pie, emotionally, physically, health, right? Taking charge um, of your life and through education. Um, but one of the most important things for being emotionally and mentally healthy, uh, being well, having uh, wellness in your life is to be financially sound or at least moving in that direction, right? Because as soon as you do take charge of your financial life, you're removing the stress of bad money habits. Um, so today's lecture is, of course, associated with this portion of the wellness wheel, something that we all, even me, struggle with um, to do well, which is being financially sound. Okay, when you're financially well, it just means you understand your finances, you're taking control of them, you have less to worry about, doesn't mean that problems are solved tomorrow, but as soon as you take control and address the issues, the more resilient you will be. Uh, with your financial future. So here is somewhat of a six, six steps that I hope you can pick and choose which ones make the most sense based on your position in life um, that hopefully you'll have some action items to go and investigate and be more financially prepared after this presentation. And if you take nothing from the six steps, I thought this was kind of nice to just throw in here as a starter, three financial rules for life pretty straightforward. Don't buy things you can't afford. If it sounds too good to be true, then it probably is. And if you don't understand it, don't sign it and don't invest in it. What you don't want to do is jump on everybody else's bandwagon and put yourself in a position um, that you're uncomfortable with. And a lot of times women will, will do so without trusting their gut and regret it later. So Three financial rules from life. If you take nothing from the presentation, these are three really good rules to go by. And if you want to um, follow this lady, Carol Roth, she's a total rock star uh, investment banker, and she's got a lot of good wisdom online. Okay, so step number one, and this is a, this is for everybody that's on this call, is to prioritize an emergency fund. Okay, and this is to make sure that you are liquid for all different types of life. Um, the, un the unplanned, the unexpected, okay, the surprise doesn't necessarily have to be an emergency, it doesn't need to be an expense that came out of getting into a car wreck and it being health related because you had to go to the emergency room and there was all this drama with this emergency. It really has so much more to do with stuff that's coming in life in the future that you didn't plan for. It was unexpected. It's a surprise. Oops, I need new tires or whatever it is, or maybe you know, we had another lockdown, right? If, if Corona didn't teach us anything, it taught us that probably having an emergency fund is a good idea to be prepared for the unknown. Okay, so prioritizing an emergency fund, what does that mean? How much is enough? Okay, this is a really good rule of thumb, three to six months worth of essential expenses. Okay, for a dual income household, uh, three months is a good number because the idea is you're both not going to get laid off at the same time. Um, but for any one uh, salaried household, probably six months is the better amount. Um, and then you may want to add in a little padding from any special circumstances. Um, and what I mean by that is, 
Maybe there's kids involved. Maybe you wanna make sure that their lives aren't disrupted. So you add a little bit of extra to your emergency fund number to account for that. Um, but what essentially is the expenses that we're talking about? Okay, we don't wanna include any taxes, uh, no payroll taxes. We don't wanna include savings. And then we don't need to account for the extras. Okay, but what is essential expense? We definitely wanna make sure that we have enough money for property taxes all of our insurance premiums. We don't want to stop paying for insurance during unplanned times. I want to make sure we have funds for any debt, mortgage, minimum credit cards, um, you know, your car payment, if that's the case. We want to make sure we have money for utilities. We want to keep the house running. Food, of course, any job necessities. So looking for jobs. And then, of course, adding special uh, expenses when it comes to kids or if you're taking care of your parents. A lot of my clients like to have their insurance deductibles in the emergency fund, um, or you can simply say, okay, this is roughly my three to six months amount, but it feels a little bit low. I'm just going to round it up because that makes me feel more comfortable. So it is okay to say, this is my feel safe amount. I always feel really comfortable if this is what I've got in my savings ready to go. Um, and for some of my higher income clients, sometimes we'll add in uh, payments when it comes to their quarterly taxes. Everybody's situation is a little bit different. And so three to six months of these essential expenses only may not be the right amount for you. Um, so you may want to make it a little bit larger, but I want to encourage everyone not to go below that three months uh, cost of these things right here, excuse me, that are on the what it is. It's property taxes, insurance premiums, any debt, utilities, food, job necessities. Make sure you have at least three months where that is concerned. Okay, so if you figure out what that number is, and it's, it's not too complicated a number to look at, you can look at one bank statement and get to the number within 10 to 15 minutes. Okay, and let's say if you don't have that number saved, that's okay, you can work towards it, but this is priority number one is to build up uh, uh, some liquid assets in case of unplanned, unexpected stuff that is coming. We don't know what it is or how much it's going to be, but I promise you it's coming. So would, do we want this just sitting in a checking account? Definitely not, right, because likely you're going to spend it, right? Do we want to put it in a savings account? For sure. Okay, we want to separate it out from where our expenses are drawn from. Um, but do we savings account at this point in time isn't all that exciting, is it? It's not really returning too much as far as interest is concerned. Um, so what we want to do to get there is just put it, set it aside in a savings account. Uh, we want to do so with a certain percentage of each paycheck. So you can set up some type of automatic savings, even if it's fifty dollars a paycheck, twenty five dollars a paycheck. Uh, but the faster you can get your emergency fund built out, the faster you can get to any other goals that you need to take care of uh, for being financially well. Um, a lot of times employers will offer the automatic option to send money from your paycheck directly to the savings account. Anything that you can do that's automated, that's the way to go. Not having to think about it means that you won't miss it. Um, and then any extras, if you get a tax refund, somebody gives you a gift, any inheritance, you can use that towards your emergency fund. You just need to make it a priority. Okay, so where should it go? You want to designate an account. Okay, this is my savings account. You can call it the savings account. We want to keep it separate, right? So then you have to actually jump into that account and move the money over to use it. I have a lot of clients who give me their emergency funds because they're less likely to call me and say, hey, I need you to send me some money because they know that just making that call, they know mm, I can probably figure it out. Um, you can look online and see if there are opportunities to open up an account at a credit union or a small bank or maybe like American Express Savings. Um, sometimes there are places that have pretty good yield. Um, and if you have a financial advisor, they likely have some good options for you. Here is a really good spot to go searching for a savings account with some decent interest. Uh, and you can even Google, you know, leading interest rates if you wanted to in a savings account and you would get to a couple of good resources. But here's one that I trust at Bankrate. And this is just CD rates. Um, 
So when it comes to setting money aside, a CD, even though they're not paying great, they're doing better than a savings account, way better than a checking account, um, and you're less likely to break your CD to, uh, for normal uh, spending than you are if it's just sitting in a savings account or a checking account. So just check out those resources. Um, and you, again, want to make it automatic, make it a priority, even just a little bit per month makes sense. Auto automated is your friend. Okay, so step number one, emergency fund. That really is step number one above, above all else is to have some cash ready when the unplanned comes about. That's even a priority above paying down your debt. Emergency fund is number one. So once you have established, that doesn't mean I want you to stop paying your debt. Keep paying that on, a, on the minimum basis. Once the emergency fund is where it should be, then we can look at reducing your debt, if you have any. Okay, so this is no fun, right? But it definitely will reduce your wrinkles and keep you youthful, if that's a motivator at all, okay? We wanna look at all of our liabilities. Okay, and I know that could be sometimes daunting in some cases, but if you add them all up, even if it's on a piece of paper, piece of scratch paper, just to address it and say, how am I going to get this tackled? Um, you want to come to terms with it sooner versus later in case it's a problem so that we can get moving in a positive direction. Um, and don't be mad at yourself. Be nice. Okay, just write it down. Say, this is the new plan. I'm going to pay it down. My goal is to do so in six months or a year and then make it a priority. Um, and here is some resources for you. Uh, one thing that I have found to be uh, uh, very helpful is using a debt snowball spreadsheet. Okay, and you can get that from this resource right here if you want to write that down. Okay, it's a free resource, uh, vertex42.com, and they have a ton of resources that are free um, on this website. Uh, you know, like Dave Ramsey has a debt snowball thing that you can do, but usually he wants you to sign up for something, which that will be a benefit, doesn't mean you shouldn't, but this is all free. There's also budget calculators, budget worksheets, a bunch of different uh, resources uh, here at Vertex 42. But this is very simple. You can download this spreadsheet, you can list your liabilities here, write in the balance, put in the interest rate, put in your minimum payment, then you can say, I want you to prioritize uh, which one gets paid off first. Um, and then you can say, uh, you know, I'd like to do a snowball, or maybe you can change this feature right here where it says strategy avalanche, where I want to pay the highest interest off first. You can drop that down and say, instead, I want to pay off the smallest balance first. Whatever makes you feel like you're successful doesn't matter, just so long as you adding a little bit to the debt to pay it down. Once the debt is paid off, then the, your debt payment number doesn't change. You're just rolling that into the next liability so they get paid off a lot faster than they would without doing this exercise. So this, once you download this, enter everything in and play around with the snowball, you'll see how effective it can be if you follow it. It, it's very, it's a very illuminating how fast you can get it done with a problem that might seem, um, you know, really hard to deal with. Okay, so maybe debt is not an issue for you, which is great. Um, and if that's the case, along with debt really is the understanding of what your spending habits are. All right, and the word budget is like one of the worst words in the English language. It's second, in my opinion, to diet, right? But it's kind of the same concept, okay? Um, you want to maybe not use the word budget. Maybe we want to use spending plan instead. And it's not about judgment or disdain about where your money goes. It's about just knowing where it goes, right? Writing it down. I want you to put into your spending plan uh, the splurges, the stuff that makes you happy, okay? Just like in a diet, you don't want to eat nothing and then binge. Same thing with looking at your spending plan and understanding where your money goes and saying, these are things that are important to me, so I don't mind splurging or spending money, more money on those things, whether it's travel or whatever it is. And it's more expensive to be a woman than it is to be a man. It just is. Hair, nails, and stuff, 
and you know, healthcare and all these things that we have to worry about. We also spend a little bit more money on taking care of other people. It just is more expensive to be a woman than it is to, uh, to be a man. So understanding that and then not beating yourself up hopefully will help you feel motivated to look at how you spend your money. And then once you've looked at your spending plan, you want to identify areas that, you know, maybe you say, I'm, I can't believe I spend that much on this. That's crazy. You know, I'm going to say this is my limit. This uh, and instead I'm going to take a portion of that and put it into savings, put it towards my emergency fund, use it in the death snowball. Right. And prioritizing you by looking at your spending and then finding ways to set money aside for a rainy day is taking care of yourself. It is the steps to financial wellness. It is how you're going to be more resilient in the future. We a lot of times take care of others and forget to take care of ourselves. And I want to encourage you guys here to make yourself a priority by going through this exercise. Okay, and here's some more pro tips. Uh, this is a really good resource if you want to check out some apps that help you track your spending. Uh, so that it's not so daunting. There's lots of good resources on your phone. Um, you can also just pull out a piece of paper and a pencil and just write it down there. That's, that's a good idea as well. Whatever is going to be the path of least resistance to understanding what your spending habits are. Okay, and in full disclosure, I struggle with this myself. Okay, doing it on a regular basis, looking at our spending habits, life gets crazy, but the sooner you start doing it on a regular basis, it'll become a habit and you'll be super successful. Okay, so some of you may have the question, right? How much do I get to splurge with, right? We're gonna do some good work on looking at our habits. We also may wanna say, okay, well, yeah, but I wanna know how much is a good benchmark for my splurge or my extras. Um, and this is a really great rule of thumb, the 50, 30, 20 budgeting rule. Okay, it's 30% splurge, 50% on the essentials, and then 20% in savings. So 20% may seem a lot, uh, but that is a really good goal for taking care of you and setting enough aside for the future. Okay, and then if you do have debt issues, if we are one of those that need to look at our debt and put together a debt snowball, Okay, maybe we want to carve out a little portion of the wants, maybe 5% five, five of the wants, and maybe the wants are 25, um, and then it's okay to carve out a little bit of the savings, but I do want you guys to be at at least a 10 to 15% um, of your net income in savings. Now, this is net income too, not gross. Okay, so your net check is uh, where these percentages need to be. Hey, Jillian. Yes. Uh, just a quick question that I'm seeing in the chat um, so that everybody can be aware moving forward. They're asking if we'll be able to share the slides with them after the presentation. Absolutely can. I'll send it over to Kayla. She'll forward it. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, so follow your plan. Once you've looked at your spending habits and identified potentially where you know, you could access up to 15% in savings and maybe 5% of that is towards debt reduction. Just follow your plan, commit it to yourself, track yourself on a regular basis. Now, the, the good way to do that is at least monthly sit down and say, okay, what happened this month? Was I on track? Was I off track? And all you're doing is checking in with yourself and readjusting. And it's okay to fail. Definitely okay to fail. Um, but what you want to do is get back on track and consider that if you're not looking at your plan at all, you're not assessing these things, you're never going to have any progress, right? And then when you do hit your marks, definitely up for a reward. Because a budget only works, aka spending plan. If you're honest with yourself about how you spend, just understanding how it is, trying to make adjustments and then moving forward a little bit by little bit to try to get to where you need to go. Um, and then here's a couple of more resources on how to make a budget, things to think about. And then of course, uh, there's an article on the 50, 30, 20 rule if you wanna read about that. Okay, uh, step number three, uh, retirement savings, where this is priority number three. 
So women tend to live a lot longer than men. The average man will live till age 76, uh, while the average woman is gonna average to age 81. Now that's an average, right? Could be that you live quite a bit longer than that, but you can see the disparity between, between men and women as far as longevity is concerned. So retirement savings should be a priority for every woman with the understanding that we will live a long life. Um, and our, on average, women tend to be healthy in older ages when it compared to men. Um, and so we're expected to live longer, right? But we don't prioritize saving for those years because we're taking care of everybody else. But also because in general, women make less than men, not always, but in general, there's also periods of time where we are raising children. So we may not have moved as fast in our career as men, or we're taking care of elderly parents, or if there's a divorce or widowhood, right? So many reasons why there's less savings when we get to our retirement years, but it's so much more a priority for us than men because we're expected to live a lot longer. And so we're more likely to outlive our money. So this really is a priority and you need to start putting money aside for retirement as soon as you start working. And even if you're 22 years old in your first job, you still need to be saving 10 to 15%. So here's a good uh, um, chart or um, visual representation of what a 12% in savings does. If you start at age 25, you're earning 8%. You're putting the money in your retirement plan or maybe into some types of investments. It's returning 8%. We have pretty regular inflation. Okay, and you need 80% of what you made right before you retire to, to live uh, the way that you lived before you retired. So this is somebody with $100,000 salary. They're saving 12% starting at age 25. Uh, they need 80% of that 100 when they retire. They make 8%. Okay, this shows you how we're building assets up until age 65. And at that level, we're drawing them down. So even at younger ages, we still need to be saving a significant amount, 10 to 15%. And the longer you wait to save, the bigger chunk of your income that savings needs to be. If you wait to start saving till you're in your 30s and 40s, you need to be saving double. And if you wait until your 40s, 20 to 40%. And consider what's going on in your life between 45 and 55. Probably got a big fat mortgage, car payments, kids in college, all that kind of stuff. So the sooner you start saving, actually the less money you have to put there and the more you have to spend over your lifetime. And here's another uh, rule of thumb if you wanted to assess if you're on track with your retirement savings. Um, so this is based on your age and it's your assets to gross pay. Now this can be not only retirement assets, but it can be if you have other types of savings or uh, any type of investment that's not your checking and savings account or your house, anything that you can turn into something that will provide income or equity uh, when you retire. Uh, for most of you, it's gonna be what's in TRS or ORP if you're working for U of H, um, or if you're not, then your 401k and savings or a brokerage account, that kind of thing. And you wanna have these different levels of assets to gross pay. So for example, if you are 45 and you make $100,000 to be on track, you have three to $400,000 in assets growing for your future. And if you guys wanna know in general what you need to retire at age 65, take your gross salary, okay? And multiply it times 20. And that's what you're gonna need when you're 65. So in this case, you make $100,000, you need $2 million to retire successfully. All right. Okay, and remember I was talking about that number, 8% rate of return. Okay, so a lot of people or a lot of women will say, well, you know, I'm happy to do the savings. I'm a little bit concerned about investing with the choices. I realize it's important, but investing is scary, right? Especially lately, yes. But if we're looking at retirement, we're looking at a long-term average. And these are numbers that I hope make you feel very confident about investing your money, investing your savings into the funds that you have available in your retirement plan or 
or if someone is uh, investing your money professionally, these are the numbers that you can count on on a long-term basis. So here's historical returns for the market for different periods of time. You can see 1928 through the end of last year, the market averaged 10%. Okay, from the last 30 years, 1972 to 2021, the market, which is the S&P 500, has averaged 11%. And over the last 10 years, we're looking at a 16% rate of return. And we're comparing this to three-month T-bills, which are essentially risk-free, okay, which right now are earning nothing. That's why we're going online to look at CD rates uh, versus treasury bonds that right now are at about 2%. And then if you were looking at other types of bonds uh, from large corporations, you would get a little bit more yield. So you can see that over the last uh, 10 years, the safe assets aren't returning quite as much, but the market has done a lot of growth. And if we look at where we were last year, so this same chart, uh, when it comes to, I'm sorry, and this should be through the end of 2020, the numbers are a lot different. So from 2011 to 2020, and I'll fix this before I send it out to you guys, the average over the last 10 years was only 12%. When we're looking at including 2021, we're at 16%. But look at the long-term numbers. They didn't change too much at all, okay? Around 9%, eight to 9%. You can count on the market returning eight to 9% over a long period of time. And we're in periods like we are today where you hear the stock market's down 10%. And I think when I looked at it uh, Friday, when I put this together, we were down, I think we were down. The market's down 6%, okay? But the NASDAQ, which is tech stocks, they're down about 13%, right? So been a lot of volatility, a lot of talk of inflation, the war in Ukraine, all that stuff. These periods of short-term volatility just mean that everything is on sale. This is a great time to put your money invested into the market during these short-term dips. And we could see a dip, continue to dip for the rest of the year. We may see a recession, um, but over a long period of time, you will revert back to this nine to 10%, eight to, eight to 10% average rate of return for the market. Anytime you see that the stock market's down, that's an opportunity to buy when things are cheap. It's a shoe sale. Everybody with me? So it's not scary. It's an opportunity. Any type of crazy markets, volatile markets are an opportunity for your retirement to get more into the market at lower valuations because we're going to get that growth over a long period of time. Okay, and one way to do it, so you say, Jillian, that's great, but I don't know what to pick. I don't know what investments I'm supposed to, how do I invest in the market? And, you know, even though we've seen volatility, you know, I do want to have some balance in my retirement. I don't want to go all super aggressive. Uh, you know, I would like some stuff that's safe. I would like some good balance. The best way to do that is through target date funds. And everyone who does have an employer that offers a 401k fund likely has some suite of target dates. This is an example of Fidelity's offering. This is their freedom target date funds. Um, and I know that I looked at U of H's different offerings and like the Fidelity, if you chose Fidelity for the supplemental savings, the 403b or the 457, they're offering the Vanguard suite of target dates. Um, doesn't matter. If you're not employed by U of H and you don't have the offering of a 401k, you could invest in these types of funds within your IRA. The reason why they are so important is because just like the automated savings I asked you to do for your emergency fund, here everything is automated for you as well. The, the, based on your age, when you make this investment, what the 401k plan does or 403b plan is they put you in the fund that has the year that's closest to your age 65 with the assumption that that's when you're gonna retire. So if you're in your 20s, they're gonna put you in the 2060 fund. If you're in your 50s, they're gonna put you in the 2035 fund, meaning they're targeting 2035 being when you retire and thus they're gonna reduce the risk 
of the investments within the fund as you get closer and closer to that year. So it's automatically readjusting the risk levels based on your age. So you don't have to worry about picking this in stocks, picking this in bonds, picking this in short-term investments. It's all done for you automatically. All you got to do is focus on getting the money into the fund or getting the money into the retirement plan, finding ways to increase your contribution, right? Your whole focus is getting the money there, then the target date managers take care of the rest. Everybody with me on that? Doesn't mean that these target dates are without risk. They are going to move up and down with the market because they have exposure to risk. But again, if you see volatility, if you see the funds are down and you're constantly putting money in every paycheck, you are buying in at lower cost and you're buying in when things are on sale. And that's a huge benefit. Okay, so step number or priority number four, we can do a really great job with our investments, right? We can put it here, we can average 10%. Um, and do all this stuff. But the second part of being financially well is to also understand that catastrophe could be coming and to ensure against that. So risk management is about making sure you have appropriate levels of insurance, but we also wanna make sure that our investments are not too aggressive. That's another reason why I like the target dates. But we don't wanna be too conservative either and miss out on long-term growth. Again, target dates are automatically changing the risk as you get closer and closer to retirement. And they will, uh, as a young person, be balanced as far as the, the equity exposure and the growth over time. Um, some other risk management measures, having an emergency fund is a huge uh, factor in not disrupting your savings. If you've got an emergency fund, you don't have to stop your uh, regular automated savings to pay for stuff that's unplanned or unexpected because you've got the cash to do it. Um, if you're not looking at your spending habits and you're undisciplined and you're making large purchases because you haven't planned for it, that could disrupt your savings and getting the money into the plan so that it can grow. Um, and then gaps in savings. So taking time off for kids or if you're supporting parents or some type of other event, if that's the case, then you just wanna be aware of how far behind you are and if there's opportunities uh, that you can take to get back into regular savings so you don't miss out on those gaps. So assessing your insurance coverage is also important when we're talking about risk management. So appropriate health insurance uh, for the makeup of your health and family. If, most of you, if you're working for U of H, that's not a concern. Uh, life insurance, we do wanna have 12 to 16 times gross pay. That's a good rule of thumb. Doesn't mean that's the right number for everybody, um, but that's a good rule of thumb. Disability is very important, especially for, for younger people. Anybody starting to work at 22 or in their 20s all the way up to your, you know, until you reach 60 years old, disability insurance is one of those ways to not worry about gaps in your savings because you, something happened and uh, there was a disability event. Uh, Long-term care is good to think about, but not until you're age 55. Um, and then you do want to be mindful of property and casualty uh, insurance. Are the policies coordinated? Is your auto policy coordinated with your homeowner's policy? If you're renting, having a little rental pro uh, policy is cheap, totally worth it. Uh, umbrella, you can get a million dollars worth of coverage for 250 bucks. Um, flood insurance is very important, especially for us here in Houston. How many people did we hear about during Harvey that didn't have flood insurance? Some of the clients of mine that said, we didn't buy it. And I said, well, I told you to buy it. And they said, well, it was expensive. And I'm like, well, were you on a floodplain? And there's like, yes. And we said, well, why didn't you get it? Um, people who also said I didn't buy it because I didn't think I need it because I wasn't in the floodplain, right? But they got flooded, right? So that is a no brainer for this. If you lived uh, you know, somewhere that wasn't prone to flooding, then maybe it's something you didn't want to pay for, but we want to be aware of those things and making sure we're covered risk-wise. Okay, and here's a big tip. Insurance is important, but we don't want to buy every single policy that a, a, a insurance person wants to sell us. We do want to be mindful of the cost 
of this protection and find the right balance. Okay, because the more you spend in insurance premiums, the less money you have to save or put towards debt, right? We wanna find the appropriate amount. Best way to do that is to maximize what your employer is offering you. So no matter who you work for, whether it's U of H or somebody else, pull out your benefits booklet and check it out. Uh, I discover a lot of opportunities for clients that I do financial planning for because I ask them to send me the benefits booklet. And I say, did you know that you can take advantage of this, 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 and this? And the best way to ensure yourself against risk is to do it through group benefits. Um, so not only uh, do you want to maximize your tax deferred savings, so more money that you put into the retirement plan, the less you pay in taxes, that's the more that you have for other goals. Uh, utilize a flex spending account. I know that U of H offers a healthcare flex spending account and a dependent care flex spending account. Those are, those are awesome tools to use. Um, and then if you can get into the health savings account, that is definitely something that you want to take advantage of. Uh, by choosing to move from the Cadillac health insurance plan uh, to the high deductible health care plan that allows for savings into the HSA, you're reducing your monthly premium for insurance. You can take that savings, put it into the HSA, okay? And that is the best type of savings overall because your pre-tax contributions into the HSA, I know that usually your employer will match or put some money into the HSA. I usually recommend that you don't use the HSA. You just let it build over time with your savings. You can also invest it into the same types of funds I was talking about. And then you have a big fat healthcare tax-free bucket of money for when you retire. And the number two expense that you have when you're retired is healthcare expenses. Housing is one and healthcare is number two. HSA is awesome. It's the best vehicle for savings. Money goes in never taxed, money comes out, never taxed, okay? So anything that you can find, if you can switch to the HSA, I totally recommend. Um, I looked through the H, uh, U of H benefits. Um, if you did need to increase your life insurance, tacking into the optional uh, term life program will be super cheap, right? Going out to get your own individual policy might be cost prohibitive. Uh, but at U of H, you can purchase up to four times your salary uh, for pretty cheap. Uh, definitely, if you're not enrolled in the Texas Income Protection Plan, that's the, the disability policies, please do so. It's so cheap um, and will be there for if there is a disability event. Very important for people who are 20s, 30s, 40s, and 50s. Absolutely. I don't recommend you buy uh, accidental death and dismemberment. It's just an added cost. It's like the toll, it's like driving around on Beltway. It's just this extra, right? If you, if you die, you die. If you're dead, you need the insurance no matter how it happens. We don't need any extra coverage because it's an accident. So if you can avoid buying the AD and d you'll save yourself a little bit of money. Again, flex spending account. Totally want to utilize those if you can. If you're in a family that you guys don't feel comfortable moving to the high deductible healthcare plan, that's A-OK. -okay. In that case, you wanna jump into the, either the healthcare FSA, uh, which you can put $2,700 in. Um, and then if you do have kids, they are in daycare, you can put up to $5,000 in a dependent care flex spending account and save on taxes where that's concerned. Um, you wanna look at other types of benefits that are potentially there, like an education reimbursement program. I know that U of H has an employee assistance program. This is when they're helping you with all the stuff associated with making life crazy. Um, so this is a COVID must. It's stuff for stress and anxiety, depression, alcohol, drug problems, um, you know, all that types of stuff, communication skills. I think there I saw there was even a coronavirus anxiety workbook. So look for all those little extras. Um, and, you know, probably you guys have some tuition benefits for dependents, right? That's a good way to save or avoid having to pay totally 100% for college. And that might be one of your goals is to set money aside for your kids. So looking, being creative and thinking about things like that, utilizing company benefits, I highly recommend. 
And then of course, uh, when it comes to savings for retirement, after you've hit your emergency fund, you have your spending plan, you've got your debt under control, you want to make sure that we are automatically saving for retirement. The easiest way to do that is through automated savings um, over and above what we do for TRS um, and into the supplemental plans like the 403B or the 457. Okay, we want to get to those 15 to 20% of your net income when it comes to saving for retirement. Park it in the target date funds and just focus on getting the money into the plan. You can also contribute to an IRA or a Roth IRA if you don't have access to retirement plan. And within those funds, you can do up to 6,000. And again, put it into something like a target date so that the, the growth is automated. Okay, and then here is um, priority number six. And this is a little bit more qualitative um, and thinking about life and being uh, financially well and creating resiliency when it comes to finances. And so we want to do our best to avoid negative partnership pitfalls. Um, when it comes to marriage, you definitely want to talk about your financial life. Many couples avoid talking about this because it's so hard and it's the least fun thing to do, but you want to be on the same page financially because that is one of the biggest reasons for divorce and divorce is extremely expensive. You want to talk about your dreams, your goals. You want to be on the same page when it comes to I'm saving for this and you may be spending this and we need to get on the same page so that we don't kill each other in the meantime. Um, you want to make sure that both of you are aware of what's going on with savings. You want to uh, consider a prenup. I mean, that's, that's a, an advice if you're looking at getting married, um, but you definitely, no matter what, want to talk about your finances. Uh, you should both be contributing to financial accounts, not just one. Um, we do want to buy life insurance for the benefit of each other. Uh, discuss your attitude about the emergency fund or the debt. You know, do you want to save for college education? What do, how do we feel about how much we want to spend on housing? Um, and then, of course, taking advantage of all tax breaks all the time is your duty as an American. Um, so in doing that, hopefully we will avoid negative pitfalls such as divorce. Okay, Divorce is super expensive. But if that does happen, that's okay. You can get back on track. Um, by, by making sure that you have good legal counsel. Um, there are different ways, uh, methods of getting divorced. Uh, some are less expensive than others. Some are a lot more healthy uh, emotionally than others. Um, you wanna make sure you understand and put together a new budget for new living expenses. Um, invest in yourself. Uh, we want to not break the saving cycle because a negative pitfall happens, such as divorce. Uh, making sure that you're negotiating, making sure that you're in charge. And if you don't know what to do, ask for help. Okay, and then widowhood. Um, I had, unfortunately, two clients in their mid-50s who did not talk about finances with their husband. Um, and both of them passed away due to, due to COVID, and they had no idea what to do next. No clue at all, right? You don't want to be in that position. It's the worst place that you can be. They didn't know where to go to get the money. They didn't know what to do, how to move forward. That is not a position that you ever want to be in. You need to understand what's happening with your finances, even if your spouse takes care of it. Um, you want to make plans for if something does happen to you, who do I talk to? Who do I ask for help? Uh, have you taken care of uh, documents? Is there life insurance to take care of each other? Um, you're going to want to research all that and own the information, not just leave it up to chance. And it's, a, it's an uncomfortable conversation, but it is super important. Um, and then you also want to make sure when life changes, you again, look at your uh, spending habits, your spending plan or what you need and just understand what it is so that it's not floating around without any definitions so that you can actually take charge about what the future is, no matter how good or how bad, um, and avoid negative outcomes. Overall, when it comes to partnerships, you just want to communicate. And that's one of the Women's Fund's tenets for resiliency is effective communication. You want to do so with your partners, you know, make sure that you um, 
feel good about communicating, communicate with your advisors and ask for help whenever you need it. Okay, so speaking of communication, does anybody have any questions? I know there's been a lot of chats. Yes, so I'm gonna go ahead and read some of the questions that we've gotten from the chat. I know that many of them were just thanking you so much for um, giving this presentation and for allowing us to share the slides with them. You provided so many wonderful resources throughout. So I think they were just worried about being able to capture everything. Um, one question that I am seeing is when you mentioned um, saving for retirement, someone said, would that be 2 million per person? So when you were talking about saving, that would be on an individual basis, right? Yeah, and so that's a, and that's a benchmark. Um, really a better assessment is to, that's a great way to say, okay, this is what I need to be saving and this is potentially the goal. It may be a lot of money in comparison to where you are today. So your spending plan will help you also determine what you need when you retire. And what you can do is you can inflate that by 3%, okay, to and whatever that number is at age 65, just multiply it times 1.03, however many times it is till we get to age 65, there's better ways to do it, if it also. But to be simple, whatever that number is, is how we can work backwards to say, what, what does our retirement number need to be? Um, and so if, if you're a joint income household, you want to look at that and say, okay, well, maybe it's not 20 times our gross income. Uh, you know, maybe it's 16 or 15. Um, uh, when, whatever the number is, it should generate about 4%. So you're going to need your age 65 expense number that you're inflating from today till then is 4% of whatever the retirement number needs to be. Is that helpful? Yes, I believe it was. Um, so the next question said, how do you feel about the fees on freedom funds? That's a really great question. I didn't want to get into the weeds with um, the cost of mutual funds because uh, that's a whole other presentation. Um, I think they're appropriately feed. Um, not all of them. They're not all cut from the same cloth. There are some that are more expensive than others, but when I looked at the funds that are available through U of H, like the Vanguard funds, those are very cost-effective. Um, if you see a freedom fund that costs more than 1%, that's expensive. Uh, we wanna target less than that, maybe eight tenths of 1% or less, or maybe half a percent. That's a good charge for a uh, target date. Perfect. Um, someone else is asking, uh, just so I'm clear, you suggest saving and paying down debt at the same time. I'm of the same mindset, but I've heard arguments for paying down debt first and then saving. So right now, um, it's, it just depends on how you feel about it. Getting rid of your debt, getting rid of credit cards, we want to do before savings. Auto loans and mortgages, those are fine to try to pay off while you're saving. And the, and the idea is that money that you set aside into retirement plans that are making eight to 10% and you're paying three to 4% in interest, there's an arbitrage there by putting money into uh, retirement plans and investments because you're, you're making 4%. You're only spending four, but you're making eight, right? Um, so get rid of credit cards if there are any because those interest rates are 13 15, 20%. Once those are paid off, all the high interest stuff, then you want to make sure that you're putting money into savings while making payments on stuff like auto and, and mortgage. They said, uh, that makes that sense. Thank you. Um, okay. So if you have questions, now would be the time to put them in the chat. I have a question for you. Um, so you provided us with so many wonderful resources throughout the presentation, a lot of which I'm going to go back and look at myself because navigating um, the financial world is a little bit confusing for a lot of us. There are so many different people out there offering financial advice. How do we know who we can trust? Um, I noticed a lot during the pandemic 
Um, there was so many new YouTube channels and, and I don't know, blogs and stuff talking about investing and how you should be investing your money and where you should be investing. Do you have any um, recommendations for how we can kind of navigate that? Um, what I will do is along with the presentation is send you a good resource for the questions that you need to ask somebody you're um, chatting to potentially to hire as your financial advisor. Uh, because everybody's a little bit different and advisors, uh, we all have our own spe special way or, or um, business model when it comes to the advice that we provide. I charge on an hourly basis. Some advisors charge for assets under management. Um, you just need to be asking those questions about fees. Uh, you know, what you need to provide for the relationship to work, what, what they are going to provide with whatever level of service you're paying for. Um, and some methods of, of advising works for some people versus others. Some people you may want to pay on an hourly basis. Some people like the idea of assets under management. Um, some of you can do it on your own um, by using the, the um, resources that are available online. I would definitely check into any calculators or retirement planning uh, modular things that you have available through whoever is the 403B provider. Like if you're using Fidelity or you can just go to fidelity.com. Um, that's a really good space uh, to find, to, to enter in your details, have them run a quick calculation. So look at your 401k plan, your 403b plan, whoever that custodian is, and see if they have calculators, resources for also doing it for yourself. Because a, a lot of you can get good resources and you're in a stage of life where you maybe don't need to hire someone or pay for their advice, uh, that you can access these resources and do it online yourself. But a lot of people say, well, I'm, I don't think I'm going to take, I'm going to put it, make it a priority. I'd rather have somebody else do it for me. Um, and just it just depends on what you're looking for and what those advisors, uh, how they provide service. Uh, I definitely would recommend you find somebody who's got designations behind their name. Uh, it doesn't have to be a certified financial professional, but I would prefer that it be a CFP um, if I were you. But doesn't mean that it's the, it's the, the, could be that somebody who doesn't have their CFP is, would be a great advisor for you. You just want to make sure that they've gone through some level of ex, uh, education over and above uh, so that they're invested into making sure that they're taking care of you on a fiduciary capacity. Thank you so much. There's no hard and fast rules. So I'm sorry, I don't have a great answer for you, but <laughs> at least give you guys a list of questions that you can ask your advisor. And based on their responses, you know, you, you assess your level of comfort. Okay, perfect. I will definitely send that over with the slides. So Jillian, I want to thank you so much for taking time out of your day to give this presentation. Um, I know that a lot of us found it really helpful and I will definitely myself be returning to these slides and picking up some of those resources. I just want to take a few moments here to go ahead and close out our presentation today. So if you are like me and you walk away from a presentation and you think, man, I should have asked this, this question, you can direct those to healtheducator at thewomensfund.org and we will we'll work to get you um, answers for the questions that maybe you have um, after you leave today's presentation. In the follow-up email, again, I will be sending the presentation slides and any resources that Jillian sends over, as well as the survey link. We would really appreciate if you would take a few moments of your time to complete the survey and let us know how we did um, and what topics you would be interested in hearing. And then lastly, I do want to encourage you to follow us on our social media accounts or visit our website, thewomensfundhouston.org. We have an updated list of presentations that we have coming up next week on Wednesday, April 20th. We have our health and wellness awareness series where we will be talking with Dr. Patel of Kelsey Siebold about addiction. So I highly encourage you to visit our website to see other wonderful presentations that we have and register for those. With that being said, I want to thank you all for your time and I hope you have a great rest of your week. Thank you.
Bye.